to last but not least to a very important topic, which is survivorship, which was not addressed so far. And I think there are lots of patients in the room which will appreciate your talk. Antonio, thanks. So thank you very much. It is a treat to have the opportunity to give the last formal presentation of the meeting. Uh, and when I received this invitation, I reached out to the organizers and I asked for some guidance. And the guidance I received was, do what you think is appropriate, but use common sense. So with that guidance that I received, what I decided to do and taking advantage of having listened to a lot of the other presentations is to take things in perspective and help us think about factors that should influence everything that is going to be discussed tomorrow morning. And one of the things that is going to be discussed is the issue of actually delivering care to all the patients we have, an issue that affects societies all over. But also, we have now the opportunity and the privilege to also potentially make decisions, smaller decisions about escalation and de-escalation of therapy. Before I begin, I want to actually acknowledge the co-authors of the manuscript that is going to accompany this presentation published with the other uh, manuscripts from this meeting. And I want to thank especially Jenny Shang, who's a senior fellow who helped me with a lot of the literature search uh, in preparation for this presentation. So the good news is that outcomes are improving. This is the US data over various decades. And you can see the overall five-year survival is improving. And it's clearly improving for patients with local disease, early stage breast cancer. So, but you can see right away that in the US and in other societies, you have an issue of disparities where you see it, outcomes in some patients not doing as well as one would like. So we know that for treatment of early stage breast cancer, adjuvant therapy has been key to the observed improvement in outcomes, disease-free and overall survival. But it is really important to realize, and we all do, that not only short-term but long-term toxicities do impact health-related quality of life and actually, unfortunately, may negatively impact on survival as well. And again, this is going to be a subject of a lot of the discussions tomorrow. This is actually a slide that I showed four years ago when I gave a presentation about the issues related to toxicities, acute and long-term toxicities. And I wanted to show it again because I think it highlights the mindsets of physicians and patients with all their biases and their anxieties. Early on, as you're receiving treatment, the focus from all of us is let's do what we need to do to maximize the chances of surviving a diagnosis of breast cancer. But as you move on and patients are done with their acute part of the treatment, the focus should become on what do you need to do to be able to live beyond the diagnosis of breast cancer. I like to tell my patients that I, I'm looking forward to becoming the doctor of your past so that you can live the rest of your life and have, develop a good relationship with your primary care physician. And I would just uh, mention to you, if you want to go back and take a look, this is, this is actually where we did, my colleagues and I did a very extensive review of toxicities associated with early tr uh, with treatment, early and late. Uh, but I'm not going to focus much on, on that today, other than highlight a couple of things that have become even more clear since then. But I think it's important that at the end of the day, what do we want? We want everything, right? We want treatments that are effective, treatments that offer value, that result in meaningful outcomes, but also treatments that can be delivered. And it's not just what we as physicians can do, but also what our societies can do, policymakers, our professional organizations. And this is going to be an important take home message. Uh, this is the beginning of a complex slide, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of things here. So I talked a lot before, four years ago, about issues of uh, comorbidities, but I want to talk about issues related to personal decisions, personal care that may influence what you, what's going to happen with your patients. So it's not, not only issues of quality of life that may have an impact on more mortality related to comorbidities, but also personal decisions, decisions with your primary care physician, health maintenance, follow-up, lifestyle changes that becomes very apparent with issues of obesity. But I think we need to in, in, talk about economic factors, allocation of resources, structural factors that are hardwired in the systems we live that truly influence uh, what we do for our patients. And there is no question, a very underappreciated issue is not just financial toxicity from costs, but actually the ability of patients to go back and have a meaningful work. This gets incredibly complicated. I don't want you all to read this, but I'm going to highlight a few of the issues. If we focus initially on issues of morbidity, just want to highlight a couple of them. One 
is the toxicities associated with aromatase inhibitors. This has been discussed over and over again, how Burstein earlier today talked about this. We know how to recognize it. We know, based on the work by Ian Partridge and others, compliance and adherence is critical. And I think that this becomes quite important. These are slides, actually. These are the data that Ivana Shestak presented a couple of days ago, two days ago, uh, highlighting that if you do look into risks using the CTS-5, this is the ATAC study, anastrozole and tamoxifen, and you can see we know that there is a subset of patients that have a higher uh, risk on the basis of baseline markers, and those are the patients that appear to benefit more from an aromatase inhibitor instead of tamoxifen. But what is interesting is that there is some suggestion that toxicities may signal a higher efficacy. And if that is going to be the case, I think it allows us to do two things. Number one is that for patients who have a low risk profile, we need to give ourselves, not only our, our patients, but ourselves the permission to potentially de-escalate therapy and give them just tamoxifen, which is a drug we've been using for a very long time. But then for patients who are really having toxicities uh, with aromatase inhibitor therapy, and you know the factors, how Burstein discusses quite nicely, we know that we may have interventions. If you're looking for a placebo effect, you can give omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, you can also give SNRIs like duloxetine. And also we know that acupuncture is better than CHAM. So there are things that we can do if we come to the conclusion with our patients that we really need to try to stick with an aromatase inhibitor. Uh, these are data that we showed four years ago as well. This paper had actually just come up right before my presentation at this meeting. Uh, and this was a, a humbling recognition that we had truly underappreciated the likelihood of developing marrow neoplasms with chemotherapy. We felt that it initially was believed, based on the CBP data, to be about a quarter of 1%. In the first five years, it became clear in this analysis of the NCCN data that the risk continues beyond five years. It may keep going beyond even 10 years, and at 10 years approaches half percent. Uh, what is, and this is probably the combination of the majority of these patients were treated with an anthracycline and the cyclophosphamide. What is interesting, and this is an analysis that Sharon Giordano at MD Anderson led, and I had a chance to participate in this work with them, uh, where the same data, the same risks were appreciated, but what is becoming clear is that there has been a major change in the patterns of treatment in the adjuvant setting in the U.S. over the last 10 years with a significant decrease in the utilization of anthracyclines and an increase in the utilization of uh, TC, in this case docetaxel and cyclophosphamide, which by itself is a regimen that is associated with significant acute toxicities. So, but at least we hope that over time we are going to see a lesser risk associated with marrow neoplasms. This is actually something that you may find of interest. This is a work that Matteo Lambertini uh, published recently, and this was a survey of 273 pay, uh, physicians, including probably mm -hmm. some of you in this audience. This was physicians who were attending the 2016 Asthma Breast Cancer in Young Women study, uh, meeting, and also 2017 St. Gallen, trying to understand physicians' knowledge and attitudes towards fertility and pregnancy in young breast cancer survivors. And you can see a substantial, at least a third of the participating uh, uh, physicians in the survey had not looked into the available guidelines on fertility uh, preservation on pregnancy after breast cancer, and the fertility preservation, the, uh, having pregnancy after breast cancer, or having pregnancy during, uh, or having breast cancer during pregnancy. So this is something, information is out there, but somehow we're not making sure that we get this information out to the people in the field, meaning all of you. Also about 20% uh, did not know which fertility preservation options were available in their countries. Uh, about a quarter of the physicians uh, had concerns that ovarian simulation being used for fertility with a new diagnosis of breast cancer uh, it may not be safe in patients with hormone receptor positive disease. And a third were unsure or thought that pregnancy in breast cancer survivals might increase uh, risk of recurrence. And I'm seeing Rich Gelber in front of me smiling because I think all of you should be thinking about the positive study. Yeah. If you don't know what a positive study is, just Google it. It's a study that allows women who are between 18 months 
months and 30 months of, with ER positive distance endocrine therapy to pause for up to two years and go on to attempt pregnancy if this is what is important for them. We need these types of data. You can't do a randomized study of pregnancy versus not. We need the study, so do think about this study, please. So um, these issues of sexuality uh, um, in adult cancer survivors, and this is what is called, oh, I love the title, the, an integrative biopsychosocial model for intervention. I think I just want to highlight issues. It's there. We don't talk about it, but you need to remember that whatever issues cancer patients had, individuals, women, had before a diagnosis of breast cancer, Rest assured that the treatment for breast cancer is not going to make things any better. So there are a lot of biological issues associated with the treatments we give, interpersonal issues, social and cultural issues, psychological issues. I think we need to talk about it and not be so shy and simply assume that it is not there. We also need to be aware that patients are doing a lot in terms of integrative therapies. This is the ASCO 2018 endorsement of recommendations from the Society of Integrative Oncology. A lot of interventions being attempted for anxiety, for stress reduction, depression, mood disorder, quality of life, and chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. And you can see the whole list of what is potentially recommended or not. Again, it doesn't mean that we need to become experts. We just need to be aware of what patients are doing. And if you don't ask patients, they are not going to tell you about these issues. When it comes to issues related to personal uh, issues, an important one, which is actually not so much personal because it also has something to do with treatments, but I think we need to keep in mind that patients are more and more coming into a diagnosis of breast cancer with obesity. Uh, and it is notable that the finding of cancers related to overweight and obesity are increasingly occurring among younger people. Obesity is truly an epidemic, a global epidemic, and affecting a lot of the young individuals. In the U.S. alone, they may, cancers that are associated with uh, overweight and obesity may represent nowadays about 40% of all cancers diagnosed. And we are really not knowing, not handling these issues quite well. Uh, this is a study that was done by the, the Consortium of Breast Cancer Pharmacogenomics. Uh, this was the ELF study, which was led by Dan Hayes, Verit Stearns, and others. This was a study of endocrine therapy, anastrozole versus exemestane. And this is a trial of about 400 women. And it is astonishing to see that these patients participating in this study in academic institutions, uh, median age of about 60, but the BMI at diagnosis was 30 which is astounding. And if you now, remembering that the majority of patients are going to survive breast cancer, the whole issue of perception, if you now apply adjuvant online risk categorization, but also the cardiovascular Framingham score, you begin to real, realize that for the vast majority of patients, their cardiovascular risk of events in the future, in the future is at least as high or higher than the risk of developing a breast cancer recurrence. So it's not just about breast cancer, it's about, again, as I said before, the rest of their lives. Obesity is associated with a variety of metabolic alterations that can lead to a lot of secondary illnesses, and there is no question that we need to do a, a much better job than we nowadays do. It has been shown, everybody knows this, it is relatively easy, I wouldn't say incredibly, but relatively easy to lose weight, but we do a lousy job in maintaining weight loss, and I think we need to get a lot better uh, with this, a lot of interventions such as the Alliance uh, Be, uh, Be Well study looking at coaching and active intervention. But it is also important to realize that this is not an issue in developing countries. If you look at changes in the last 40 years in the regional distribution of global obesity, this was an issue in high-income Western countries, Central and Eastern Europe, and nowadays it is a global issue affecting Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and others. And we know the guidelines. This is one example from the American Cancer Society Guidelines on Nutrition and Physical Activity for Cancer Survivors. And I'm sure that these are things that all of us in the last three days have been doing routinely, which is to make sure that we're worrying about what we eat. It's to make sure that we engage in regular physical activity. Maybe I should pause here and ask you all to stand up for a second and do some jumping jacks. But also thinking about a dietary pattern. Make sure that we recommend that our patients eat uh, a diet 
high sort of with lots of colors, fruits and vegetables. We need, but again, it's not that we are going to use that time to make these recommendations in our busy visits, but we need to create an infrastructure. We need to ask, we need to advise, we need to assess, assist and arrange. Because if we don't talk about this, patients are just going to be thinking about issues related to the treatments that they do receive. And I mentioned to Judy Garber that I was going to show one slide about a topic that has not been discussed in this meeting uh, t until now, which is the whole issue of genetic counseling for newly diagnosed breast cancer patients. In terms, if you look on the left side, the left side columns for high-risk individuals, about 80% of the patients would like to have genetic counseling, 70% will talk to with any clinician about it, 40% will talk with a genetic counselor, but only half are actually having genetic testing. So we are miserably failing, and I think we need to wake up to these issues. Again, as part of their survivorship for their, in relation to second cancers, but also related to issues associated with their families. So when we think about goals of survivorship care, we are interested in better care, better outcomes. We are interested in long-term assessment of complications and screening of new cancers, better coordination of uh, care between specialists and primary care providers, better utilization of resources. But you don't need to become a survivologist to be able to help your patients. I think we just need to, you know, as part of a multidisciplinary care, we need to think about these issues and create infrastructures where we can refer patients to these services. Finally, I want to touch on issues, uh, economic issues, structural hardwire factors, uh, situational factors, burden on family and family caregivers, and actually employment as a measure of financial toxicity. This is resource stratification developed by Ben Anderson, Bob Carlson, and others in the Breast Health Global Initiative. Uh, what would be recommended at a minimum for low, intermediate, and high income countries. Uh, but it is very clear, this is uh, work done by Ben and also Catherine Heather, uh, Reeder Hayes from UNC, that if you don't do the right thing in terms of appropriate surgical treatment, radiation, chemotherapy, targeted therapy when appropriate, but also survivorship issues, obesity, sedentary life, you have the line on top, what would be the optimal breast cancer survivor, but ultimately in the bottom, what's really happening. So this becomes a missed opportunity, and we have a huge responsibility. Financial hardships is pretty interesting. This is a systematic review going back to 1990, and you can see in the top right, this is about 45 papers on financial hardship, and this is an issue that has been only discussed and investigated over the last 10 or 15 years. We totally ignore ish these issues before. They can affect uh, the ability to uh, participate in employment, loss of income, bankruptcy, uh, issues of distress associated with cancer care, concern about uh, being able to cope with daily expenses, and also what decisions that uh, patients will make about rationing resources and missing appointments, not having treatments. This is a complicated slide, but just to highlight, at least in countries like the US where your health insurance is linked to employment, uh, that has inf influence about whether you seek treatment or not, when you seek treatment, indirect costs associated with time, and uh, not for you, just for you, but for also for your caregivers and their own employment, expenses, and all coping mechanisms and uh, strategies that you're going to use to try to receive the treatment being recommended, and if you don't, the potential negative impact on survival. Uh, what this slide shows is that this issue is out there. There is a significant concern about out-of-pocket expenses associated not not with uh, lodging, child care, but especially with medical expenses, and about 3% of patients are being affected by bankruptcy. And if you have a bankruptcy and you live in the United States, you have an overall heart rate ratio of dying of about 1.79. So you, you have an increased risk of dying from your diagnosis of cancer if you also have an associated uh, issue of, of, uh, of bankruptcy. So companies are beginning to think about that. This is actually a survey of 500 executives uh, done by the Economist Intelligence Unit. Uh, they recognize that cancer survival is, there, is here. Fortunately, a lot of their employees are now uh, affected by cancer. All are concerned about loss of productivity, the cost of day loss, uh, the, cost, the cost of rising insurance premiums, and this is becoming increasingly an economic and health burden for society. 
you can see that the number of cancer survivor, uh, survivors is going to increase. Uh, the, 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 if you look at the bar graphs on the left side, the red uh, bar imply the number of women who are becoming cancer survivors. And I think a lot of this has to do with the greater penetration, the num higher number of women who are becoming active in the job market. Uh, cancer survivors are very uh, worried about the ability uh, to return to work and uh, how to reintegrate them into the workplace. And this appears to be especially an issue in Asia uh, Pacific uh, countries. And concerns about discrimination as well, again, especially in Asia Pacific. Uh, also, there are a lot of discussions about what are the employer policies around uh, cancer. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of how uh, managers, their direct reports, can handle these issues. 65% of, of uh, executives believe that their managers are well equipped to support direct reports dealing with cancer, but about 12% believe that managers are really not well equipped. This is something we can actually do ourselves and that falls potentially into patient reported outcomes. This is actually the FACET, the Functional Assessment of Chronic Illness Therapy. This is a simple questionnaire we can give to our patients uh, before they come to see us where they can potentially alert us about things that are potentially worrying them because this may influence their ability to receive the treatment. So as we come to a close of uh, my presentation, but also as we come to a close of this the formal sessions uh, in preparation for tomorrow, I think we need to understand and recognize the global burden of women's cancers. Uh, two million women worldwide are diagnosed with breast or cervical cancer each year, uh, and yet where a woman lives, her socioeconomic status and agency largely determines whether she will develop one of these cancers and ultimately survive, and cancer is unfortunately contributing to a perpetual cycle uh, of poverty. Breast and cervical cancer are major threats to the health of women globally, particularly in low-income and middle-income countries. But you don't need to go outside of the U.S. This on the left side in the U.S., uh, age standardized mortality rate for breast cancer. In the middle, we see decreases over time from since the 1980s. But on the right side, we see pockets especially in the southeast where actually the percent change in age standardized mortality is going in the wrong direction. And it should be no coincidence that this coincides and overlaps quite nicely with pockets of poverty. So we want care that is safe, equitable, and affordable. Those of us in the U.S. have a big problem, other parts of the world as, as, as well. So as the St. Gallen Breast Cancer Conference comes to a close, I think some thoughts for tomorrow and for us to take home. We really learned in the last couple of days that we now have some better tools to parse patients into meaningful categories. Analytic, we have analytically and clinically validated biomarkers with demonstrable utility. We want to have the ability to give the right treatment for the right patient in the right setting at the right time. We need to be better prepared to actively help our patients cope with impact on quality of life, their ability to return to life. We need to ask patients and caregivers about issues of financial toxicities. And I think we all have an obligation to work within uh, our health and political systems and with our professional societies to reduce barriers to care and develop frameworks to evaluate and improve value of new and older treatments. And it goes without saying that patients cannot be helped by treatments that they cannot take. So these are three quotes in the last couple of days, and I took note of them, and I wanted to repeat them before we finish. Uh, this is by Leslie Fallowfield, a beautiful presentation on Wednesday. We should escalate treatment with nece when necessary, but we really should de-escalate whenever possible. Martine Picard, when she was giving her presentation, or, or, we came to the microphone actually, and said, I don't want to make this a political talk, but actually it should be a political talk because we need to worry about these issues. Otherwise, other people will for us and make decisions we dislike. And Eric Weiner came to the microphone as well and said, drug costs are going to bankrupt the system. And I think that this is absolutely true. Uh, many of you may recognize this. This, uh, this is Pogo. He is the cartoon uh, possum who lives in the Okefenokee Swamp. Uh, and uh, in 1970, the first Earth Day, 
uh, this cartoon by Walt Kelly came out, which, which is fantastic. This is actually, this is an old saying, but it was uh, changed a little bit. Uh, and in this case, he's looking where he lives, his swamp, and it is a mess. It is absolutely, totally polluted. And essentially, he says, we have met the enemy, and it is, uh, he is us. So essentially, we created the systems we have, and I think we have an obligation to adjust that. Thank you.